Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Expat Hoops. I'm Tony Budney alongside Andy Hoverman. Today's guest is Odie Anosicki, a Staten Island, New York native who graduated from Siena in 2013 and led the nation in rebounding twice and turned pro. Odie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. So we were actually talking a little bit off the pot as well. And as Tony just stated, you uh, had quite the college career, uh, led the nation in rebounding twice. I think one of the seasons of those two, uh, as you mentioned, off the pod that you led the uh, the entire NCAA in, in double doubles. So um, you have a really unique start to your pro career. Uh, kind of the question that we ask our guests is when did you really kind of like tangibly start it going down the road to becoming pro and with yours, I'll add the caveat a little bit, the twist of, uh, you know, balancing the NBA and overseas game in your, you know, as you're coming out and after your first season, if you could kind of take us through that really unique period in your career of how you not only got started, but also how the NBA was still in the mix for, you know, the first season or so overseas. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think to start just as a young kid, you know, definitely aspired to be a pro. You know, the NBA was my goal, my dream. You know, I worked endlessly to try to attain that. Um, but I would say to your question, where it started to become real was uh, my junior year. You know, my junior year had a really nice season. Uh, like 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 you mentioned, I led the nation in rebounding, um, finished that year. I led the nation in double-doubles. And then at the end of the season, and you got to remember, this is about 10, 12 years ago, the landscape was different. It wasn't, you know, guys throwing their name into the draft or whatever. If you were a mid-major guy, especially as a junior, you weren't really throwing your name in, in the NBA draft, not even to get feedback. It just kind of wasn't, you know, what, what was done at that time. So I wasn't thinking anything of it. I was definitely thinking about coming back for my senior year. But I remember my head coach at the time, Mitch Bunny Girl, he had gotten a phone call. He called me into his office and he said, listen, the NBA had sent me a packet uh, that we need to fill out basically uh, to gauge your interest on en entering the NBA draft. Um, I was floored. I, I was shocked. Um, it's not something that I was expecting. Um, and I decided against it. I don't even think I sent it back. I was so focused on coming back, you know, my senior year it just wasn't something that interested me at the time. Um, I wanted to graduate um, and I wanted to see Sienna through. Um, so went back for my senior year again, had a nice senior year again, had a uh, led the nation rebounding. Um, and then the interest really picked up after my senior year. I went to Portsmouth, which is, a, you know, the all senior invitational in front of all NBA teams. And I, I did pretty well there. I was able to parlay that into an NBA workout uh, with the Celtics. And then from there, I went undrafted, but I went to summer league with the Denver Nuggets. And that was a really cool experience. Um, you know, did pretty well there. And I was able to get a, a contract in Italy in the top league, uh, which was great. It was a great situation for a rookie. Uh, I was able to play a lot of minutes in the top league. And, and, and it was great. Great experience, great exposure. So I went there and again, led that league in rebounding. So there was a level of consistency that I had been proving that I could really rebound at a high at a high rate. I did at the mid-major le level twice, and I was doing it against bona fide pros. So with that being said, winding down my rookie year, I'll, I'll never forget, I got a call from my agent, and he was like, listen, like you, you, you're doing great over there in Italy. I just got a call from the New Orleans Pelicans, and they really like you, and they're interested in signing you in the offseason. And uh, I was really excited about that. Um, I went home end up playing summer league with the Celtics. Um, and, and because I had such a nice season in Italy the prior year, I had gotten a very lucrative offer to go back to Italy for a second year. And I pulled the trigger and I signed it. Um, even though I had a really nice game in, in summer league with a double double, but I did not, I wasn't able to see what would come to fruition because I had already signed back in Italy. I was comfortable. I was happy. Uh, the compensation was nice. So I never really knew what would come from the NBA side that summer. And I went back to Italy. And then from there, I just was very comfortable with my overseas career. And I never really pursued the NBA ever again. But um, it's been a nice ride for sure. And so uh, one of the things that kind of we we wanted to take like that kind of like 40,000 foot view over this particular point in your career. 
um, because it's a great summary of it all, especially as you're trying to balance. All right. There is NBA interest. Like you said, that's your dream. Uh, but you go overseas and you establish yourself. But that's where I actually want to return to. So that was kind of like the 40,000 foot view of like this like year and a half period. But going back then to the decision actually to go over to Italy and sign with your first club uh, obviously led to your second contract in Italy being lucrative and going back there feeling comfortable. But take us through that first season actually in Italy um, and, and really kind of like off the court and getting yourself adapted to the life. And what was that like for you at that period of time? Absolutely. I mean, you know, that off season from my senior year of college going into my rookie year, um, there's a lot of just question marks. You know, you have a good year, you're expecting contracts to kind of just be rolling through. And it, that, that's not exactly what happens just due to the fact that, and I'm learning this now, teams aren't so eager to sign rookies. You know, they just feel like they don't have much experience. Um, the, the way the game is played, living uh, professionalism, there's a lot of reasons as to why teams kind of shy away from rookies. Um, so I didn't, I didn't know that. I was thinking, you know, contracts would kind of just keep rolling through. Um, but I got this one in Italy, which was great. Again, the, the selling point there was playing in the top league in Europe and being able to play meaningful minutes. You know, they told me I'd be a starter, which is, which is again, rare for a 22-year-old rookie in, in such a league like Italy. So when I got it, thought about it for a little bit, um, I was scared, you know, 22, you know, going all the way over to Italy, but pulled the trigger and I couldn't have been in a better place. Like, I, I mean that from no, so many different perspectives, like the people were so good to me, so welcoming, uh, I was not the only rookie. I think I was joined by three or four other rookies on the team. So that was great. We were all able to kind of grow together and just figure it out on the fly. Since we were all rookies, the club had a certain certain level of expectation. They weren't expecting us to win a championship or something like that. That was good, that the, that the expectations were tempered and we were able to lose games and figure things out and no one was going to get cut and no one's going to be threatened because we're all rookies and we were a very low budget team just trying to stay in the league. So all that, that whole dynamic was perfect for someone like me, just able to get my feet wet, but not have to look over my shoulder, just able to play 35 minutes. And uh, I was able to produce at a high level. So uh, I'm very thankful to this day uh, to my first club. Yeah, for sure. And uh, get your feet wet. You did. You averaged 14 and 13 for Pissarro that, that season before going over to Strasburg. Um, for the rest of that year, you are far from the first guest in this podcast to compliment the Italian basketball leagues for the way their fans and the way they treat people and all that kind of stuff as well. So uh, that has been a common theme with uh, with people that have been on this podcast talking about even lower level Italian leagues, um, the passion and, and things like that, that the experience over there is uh, definitely on a high level for sure. Um, off the court stuff. Um, let's talk about your uh, second season. You go back to Italy for. Uh, with a different team this time, uh, maybe a different set of expectations. So after being the leading rebounder in Serie A, uh, going over to France, playing some time there, um, having another um, period in which you went to an NBA summer league, looking into that, you decide to settle in and become an international basketball pro. You go back to Italy. Uh, what was that like for that second season for you? Oh, yeah. So I, I skipped over that last part in France. So I, I finished my rookie year in, in Italy, went home for a week, and then I got a call from Strasbourg in France saying that they were in the playoffs and their big man had gotten hurt. I think he tore his ACL. He asked me if I'd be interested in flying out and playing the playoffs with them. And I said, yeah. So I went out there. Um, I think they had just advanced to the semifinals when I got there. So we we won the semifinal round and we went to the championship and then we lost. So I was only there a short time, maybe two, two games. Weeks. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, the I two biggest there. games of the season, but two games. Right. Right. So I wasn't there very long, but again, really cool experience there. And then, uh, yeah. So I went home, signed back in Italy. And again, so kind of like I touched on now, the expectations were different than my, than my rookie year. I'm now moving into a club with a much bigger bu budget, more experienced players. Um, different atmosphere. Uh, they were hungry for success. It was a team that had, again, just in the past, maybe spent money frivolously, uh, didn't have the success that they wanted and was really looking for this year to be something different. 
so we brought in, you know, high, high quality, high caliber players. And I was able to go there and, and, and produce once again, not at the level that I did my rookie year, but then again, I didn't have to because I was surrounded by better players. So it was, uh, again, a really good year. You know, missing the playoffs by a couple of games, but um, overall successful season. And then from there in year three, you um, spend a, a very short amount of time with um, Spain. Uh, you sign with them in August. You end up in um, one of the teams there, but you're parting ways with them in October and heading to Greece. Uh, mm-hmm. So walk us through that first period of that year. What what happened there? How how did you end up leaving uh, the La Liga and heading heading to Greece in just a short amount of time? Yeah, no, that was uh that was probably the most tumultuous season of my career. It sure does look like it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So I finished my second year again. Uh, I believe I led that. I believe I led the league in rebounding again in Italy. Um, so now that's back to back years. I'm doing that. Um, and I was able to sign with Basconi, a Euroleague team in Spain. So I went there uh, end of August, and then we're going through preseason. I got really bad tendonitis in my knee. And you guys have been doing this enough that I'm sure you spoke to enough players that when you're injured, especially during preseason, they don't really give you much time to recover. I mean, mm-hmm. they feel like they have enough time to find a new player and kind of just keep the ball rolling. So that's exactly what they did, especially as a high-level EuroLeague team, you know, with big-time expectations in a league like the ACB. So they brought in another big. Um, they told me I could stay in rehab. They, they, you know, they weren't cutting me by any means. I could stay in rehab. They, had, I, I was a young player. I think I was 24 at that time. Uh, they actually wanted to re-sign me to a, another year deal and just keep me under contract and loan me out for that first year and then maybe bring me back the second year. Uh, so they were just like, uh, those are your options or we can part ways now. We'll pay you up to where you are now and we'll just separate and we'll part ways. So I was going to stay. I really liked it there. Um, just the atmosphere, EuroLeague. I was just going to stay in rehab, and which I did. And then my agent said, you have an offer in Greece from a Euro Cup team in Athens, really solid club. Uh, you know, they're really looking for a big, uh, you know, they think you'd be perfect. So I pulled the trigger. I went there. Um, really solid club, historic club, great history. Um, really enjoyed being in Athens. Beautiful culture, beautiful weather. But just the playing style, I think, just wasn't for me in Greece. Hmm. Uh, I would say it's more, in my opinion, I would say it's more small ball oriented, guard oriented. Um, just doesn't really fit my game uh, for the most part. So I went there, struggled to fit in. We had some other talented players. We had a, another really good uh, Greek big guy who was taking a lot of the minutes. So it was just kind of tough for me to find my rhythm, especially getting there late. So we parted ways. I went home. I was home for the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas. And then that's when I went back to Italy in January to Brindisi. And that's so- where you ended the season. Yeah, that's that's one of the really kind of more interesting arcs too, especially when you're talking about the decision uh, between sticking around with Basconia and uh, going over to to Athens. Uh, obviously, you know, with the benefit of hindsight now that it, it you know probably wasn't for you in terms of the league style of play, but obviously, like you said, uh, being in Athens isn't exactly bad. But um, that contract situation sounds pretty unique um, in, in the sense that. Uh, I'm not sure offhand I can remember another guest from our podcast so far that's had something like that where there's been something so early on in the season where they're saying, hey, look, we like you. You know, you're not necessarily going to play, you know, while you're rehabbing. You can stick around and, you know, when you're well enough, we'll loan you out and kind of like, would it be kind of like the one plus one renegotiating? Like, what was that kind of that that talk like? And uh, and I, I would say not only was was the talk like between you and the club, because I think you just hit on it, but was there a discussion between you and your agent of like, I really think that you should stay here or that Athens is the kind of club that you would leave for? Yeah. I mean, you know, the situation with Basconia, they were very professional in the way that they handled things. Uh, you know, they brought in a new big and, you know, once you see that, you kind of know the, the writers on, on the wall. 
And then again, like they said, they brought me in. I'll never forget. They brought me in. You know, it was nothing that I had to hear from someone else, or whatever. They brought me in face to face. And they were like, listen, your niche is not where it needs to be. We were in, I don't know, mid-September at this point, let's say. The games are going to start in about two or three weeks. And I was a young player, so I think they looked at me as like a prospect. They were like, listen, we're willing to sign you to an additional year. This year, when you get better, we'll look for a team. We'll loan you out. And then if you do well at that situation, we'll bring you back here the following year. You know, if that's something that you're willing to do, we'll do that. As a young player, why not? Um, I have a Nigerian passport, so that's helpful in Spain. So I'm not taking up um, a spot of an American. So there's a lot. there was a lot of reasons on their side to want to do it. And then for me, too, I was thinking about it. You know, it's a Euroleague team. Why not? Um, but then when the... the which I was thinking about doing, but then when the deal from Greece came in, that kind of swayed my judgment. I was like, you know what? Let me just part ways with this team. Let me go to Greece. Then I just, I, I have my freedom in a sense. I, I don't have this two-year deal on me if I'm still in Basconia. I'm just free. I could go to Greece and then I can kind of move how I want next summer. That was kind of my logic. Um, but then... Um, it just didn't work out. I think mostly was my fault, I would say. I, I think I rushed a little bit. I took a deal with the with the team that maybe, or in a league that maybe doesn't fit my style. I probably should have waited and did my research. Um, but this team was, they were looking for a big, they were in a rush. And um, I pulled the trigger. But like we talked about in hindsight, I probably should have waited a little bit and did my research because when, when I went there, just wasn't a good fit for me playing style wise. And then they also had a Greek big who was really good. Who I wasn't better than I'll be honest with you. And I would have been playing behind him anyway, even if it was a good fit for me. So you live and you learn. Absolutely. And uh, so you've now gotten through three seasons. Uh, you've, you've touched in Italy uh, at least uh, for each of those three seasons, but Season four, you're back in Italy full time with a different club. Take us through what that season's like, especially as you've you've gotten a lot of experience not only within that country, but also at the same time in different countries. And then, you know, your decision to kind of go back to Italy that season. What was that like? Yeah. So after Greece, that didn't work out. So I went back to Italy in January. So I finished up the season there. And um it's always nice because, you know, when you when you play in a country and you do well, and I guess when you, you treat people a certain way, they'll always want to bring you back. So a year like that where I had already switched two teams, Italy brought me back with open arms. So I went back there to Brindisi, a really fiery fan base in the South. Um, I really enjoyed my time there. And I led the league and rebounded again, you know, to finish that season. Um, so the following year, um, a team called Varese, which is up north, right outside Milan, uh, they called me during the summer. Uh, the, the coach is a former player, a really knowledgeable guy. You know, he said he wanted to build a really big team. Um, you know, he signed myself, another five-man, a couple uh, big Italians. He felt like last year he had the team had gotten beaten up inside. So his thing was to just sign a really big physical team. And I like that, you know, fits my my playing style. So I went back there to Italy. Varese, a tremendous fan base, again, with great history and big time expectations. And I'm not sure if I was ready for the expectations to start off. Um, I think I struggled a little bit to start the season. Um, and then I really found my rhythm halfway through. And then I could be wrong, but I think I led the league and rebounded again my fourth year. I could be wrong. <laughs> Um, so I had a really nice season that year too. And, uh, th those Varese fans were really something special, just the way that they treat you. Now they're on you when you lose now, it's, it's not, it's not all roses. They're on you when you lose, but when you win, I'm not sure there's a better fan base to play for in Italy. That was actually something I was, it, I'm glad you'd hit on because I was going to follow up with that, where you were saying earlier on in your answer that, uh, that you weren't necessarily ready for the expectations. I mean, is there something that you can kind of point to? Um, in, in terms of your experiences, was there something like media attention or was it just, you know, the crowd's reaction to you uh, earlier on when you were struggling a little bit and and how you actually did get through that? Because obviously you just said that 
there's not a better fan base when, you know, things are, are you know, basically uh, going well later on towards the end of the year, like you were doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say there's two main things that influence, uh, you know, expectations. I would say the history of the club. And I would say the budget of the team, I would say those two things really impact and influence the expectations, kind of like I touched on my rookie year. OK, historic club. They used to be yearly. They had big time players in the past, but the budget was very low. They the fans knew that we, you know, we were all rookies. You know, we were all just trying to just stay in the league. So they, so they knew that. So expectations were tempered. But let's say Varese, historic club, again, former yearly club, you know, great history. But our budget was higher than, let's say, what I what we had in Pezzero my rookie year. So, like, they're expecting maybe not a championship, but they're expecting playoffs. They're expecting to be competitive. They're expecting to, okay, you might lose to a EuroLeague team, but don't lose by 20, you know, lose by six, seven, you know, fight, you know, something like that. So, again, expectations are just different. So, I'm not sure if I was just ready uh, for that. So with great history, the fans are so passionate. Like the city of Varese, like they breathe and live and eat basketball. Everywhere you go, the games, the, the, they're, they're lighting fire and all that in the, in the stands. They're writing on your social media. Like all of that stuff, they're super passionate, which you love on one hand, you know, especially when you're winning, but it's tough to deal with, especially as a, you know, we're young. I'm 24, 25 at this point, especially as a young kid, you know trying to figure it out. Um, it was hard to deal with, but again, I'm thankful that they were patient with me. And um, I, I'm thankful that it started off low Rocky, but it ended on a high note. And um, I, I'll always have, I have love for that city for sure. Thanks to SeatGeek for sponsoring Expat Hoops. We recently became a brand ambassador for them. SeatGeek is a ticket app that takes the confusion out of buying tickets. They offer a 0 to 10 score on each ticket to know if you're getting a good or a bad deal. Green means good, red means bad. You get the idea. It's a really easy way to get tickets to events. Plus, our viewers get $20 off their first ticket purchase with the Expat Hoops code. Click the link in the description to download the app. Remember the code Expat Hoops, E X P A T H O O P S, all one word, to save yourself $20 off your first ticket purchase with SeatGeek. In our house, when we use a VPN, we are sure to use NordVPN. NordVPN secures up to six devices and is compatible with Windows, Mac OS, Linux, Android, iOS, and even your Wi-Fi router. Plus, it's no risk to your wallet. Head over to their website for pricing or contact customer support 24-7. And remember, your purchase is always safe with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Click the link in the video description to use our code and make sure you're secure with NordVPN. So, so far in your career, you have touched on a lot of different Serie A teams. You've been to Strasbourg, you've been to AEK in Athens, uh, and you are now going to head to year five to Real Batiste in Seville. These are not all, these are pretty big clubs. These are prominent. People know their name. Um, but this is going to be your first real foray into La Liga in Spain after um, in year three, um, you had um, a bit of a misfire, uh, signed with them and left. So what is it, what was your year five like in uh, Real Batiste? Yeah, for sure. So so that summer after Varese, um, I, yeah, I think I led that league in rebound and so had a nice market. Um, I had a team in France that I passed up on. And then this kind of came later on in the summer. You know, they were looking for a big guy. I heard great things about the city of Sevilla. Um, and then obviously I already knew about the league. I knew how competitive the Spanish league was. And I was looking to redeem myself, you know, after what happened in Basconia a few years back. So I really wanted to go to the Spanish league and, and, and prove that I could play there. So I ended up signing in Sevilla. And um, I'll say unequivocally like the Spanish league is the best league in Europe. That that's, that's my opinion. And I'm sure many players agree. We've said so, it on the pod before ourselves. So yeah, I'm just saying like, I, I've been fortunate to play in a lot of the top leagues, top to bottom night in and night out. The Spanish league is the best league in Europe because there are no bad teams. 
there are no bad coaches. Um, there's very few bad players. Um, each team has depth. You know, each team can play eight, nine, ten guys. The Euroleague teams can play 12, 15, 18 guys. They have 18 real pros on the team. So you're really not going to get a night off. Um, it just every day is a battle. First Sunday, you're playing Real Madrid. Next week, you're playing Gran Canaria. Then you're going on the road, you're playing Barcelona. Then you got to fly, you got to play Malaga. Then you're playing the team at the bottom, which might be us, Real Madrid, uh, Real Betis, where we're fighting to stay in the league. So it you just never have an off night in that league. And that was really fun for me. Um, had a chance to play alongside really good players. Had a chance to play against some really good players. That was Luka Doncic last year before he got mm -hmm. drafted. And he was MVP of our league at, as an 18-year-old. Um, so, so that was a lot of fun. And um, just to speak to that competitive level of the league, we were really talented and we ended up going down. We ended up getting relegated that year. Um, so that was tough from that standpoint. You know, individually, I had a nice season, but uh, doing this long enough, team success matters way more than individual success. So uh, it was unfortunate that we went down. And uh, thus far, looking at the, the remainder of your career, which will be over shortly, this is thus far your only full season in Spain uh, that you've had in your career so far. Uh, year six, you go to France, uh, back to France after being in Strasbourg earlier, you go to Le Portel. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell us about the French League. French league is is great. Very different than the Spanish league. Um, I think, you know, I think they give a chance to their to their local players more than let's say the Spanish league. They really try to not only develop their French players but let them play, give them exposure. So it's just a different league. Very athletic, very up and down. Um, I think it's a great league for someone who's on the rise. I really do. So I went there uh, to La Portel. Um, they were middle of the pack when I got there. And um, an another competitive team, you know, they were playing, I believe, FIBA Europe Cup the year before. Ambitious. They had moved up from the second division just a few years before. So ambitious, really trying to make a name for themselves in the top league. Uh, so I went there. We were able to stay in the league that year. I had a nice season. Great memories, another passionate fan base. You know, we're way up north, not much to do. So for every game day, people are coming out and, and they're excited because that's that's the only show in town. So only have great uh, memories there in La Portel. So after that, you actually go to Mexico, which is, is a club that you've actually been to a couple times now. But this is, I believe, the first time that you went to Mexico to go play for them. Um, and this is kind of uh, like essentially kind of like the summer league correct yeah like the thing after that that year in in france you know i told my agent because it, it was becoming kind of like a pattern it was i was having pretty good individual success my numbers were always solid but my teams were were kind of struggling each year you know between real betis we went down then laportel we kind of almost went down, but we didn't. It, it, it Kind of like I said, like it was just weighing on me mentally and it was hard for me to take that next step in my career. Team, And I see how it works now. Teams like to sign players from winning teams. If you're putting up numbers, but you're on a, let's say a lower team or a losing team, you'll be able to get a job the next year, but you're not going to be able to progress and jump to better teams and higher level teams within that league. It's going to be hard for you to do, not impossible, but hard for you to do. And I was just kind of that hamster, just, just rolling back and forth, like getting jobs, but not progressing in my career. So I told my agent that summer, I said, listen, I don't care where I have to go. All I want to do, I just want to be on a winning team. I, that that's That's all I want to do. I want to be on a winning team. And I'll be able to handle it from there. And he said, okay. So he said, listen, I got the best team in Mexico for you. Best team. They want you. Uh, high level, first class organization. You wouldn't think that, you know, maybe from what you hear from Mexico. I was very impressed when I went down there. 
First of all, the club's in Monterey, which is a beautiful city, about two hours away from the from the Texas border. Very Americanized, a great city. Then the club itself, very, very professional, high level, the way they run it. Uh, just everything is just perfect. Our apartments are high rise, you know, with a pool. Our pay was not not on time. It was early a lot of times, which is unheard of. Wow. Know? Yeah. <laughs> Again, even in like Mexico, no less, like we were getting paid early. So just a very, very professional club who had just come off of a championship um, the year before. So I went there and, and really enjoyed it. And the thing with them is their season, uh, it, it runs, it, it ran shorter than a typical European season. So went there, had a nice season and we finished in February. We lost in game seven of the finals. And um, I really enjoyed it. And the next week is when I got an offer to go play in South Korea. So that's where it gets really interesting here because now you're in February of 2020. Uh, you go to South Korea. Um, it's it's a league that pays really well, typically uh, has lots of nice amenities and features to it. Um, if you would kind of take us through what your unfortunately limited experience will be there and why it was so limited. Yeah, absolutely. So, so again, the, the Mexican um, experience, it really served its purpose. It did exactly what I wanted it to do. It, it got me on a winning team and I was able, and I played well. And then just the whole lens around me changed. Now I was looked at as a player that not just only put up numbers, but put up numbers on a good team. So with that, that attracted, you know, different offers from different teams, but the South Korea one was real lucrative. So I went there uh, right after I finished in Mexico and um, season was winding down. This is February. And I went there, I practiced for about a week and uh, played in one game. I had, had a nice game. I remember. And we, we had another road game right after. So we were traveling from that first road game to another one. We're on the bus. And we get word that the night before in a hotel, there was someone in there who had COVID. And we're like, okay, no big deal. Uh, and they're like, well, no, he was at breakfast this morning. And he was in there, you know, touching, you know, like the buffet style, he was touching everything and he's in the, in the breakfast. So that's when panic kind of set in. And uh, I remember I did not go to breakfast that morning, but a few of my teammates did. So they're checking the cameras and they're doing the, you know, the contact tracing and all of that. And, you know, the league is is, is calling us and stuff like that. So they're all, we, we ended up having to get off the bus and just stand outside. I remember just stand outside away from each other and just waiting for word from the league. I, I remember that. So we're sitting outside. And finally, the league says, okay, game tomorrow is canceled. Go back to your city and just wait to see what we're going to do. So that's what we did. And then about two days later, the league said, okay, there seems to be some more cases kind of popping up around the country. We're going to pause the league for four weeks. You know, we're going to pause the league for four weeks. In four weeks, we will reconvene and we will see what we're going to do from there. So I was like, all right, cool. So uh, the management said, all right, Odie, go home for a week. There's no need for you to be here for four weeks practicing. Go home for a week, come back in a week, and then we'll go from there. So that's exactly what I did. I went back to the States. And it's just so crazy because when I'm thinking about it, when I went home, there was no hysteria back home in the States yet. Nothing. Maybe there was a... I don't even remember any chatter about it, like anything. And I'm from New York, so the, the epicenter of the pandemic. So there was nothing when I went home. But I remember the day after I flew back to South Korea is when all the craziness happened back home with the toilet paper and people going nuts. That broke like the day after I left to go back to South Korea. So yeah, so I'm, I'm back in South Korea now, practicing for about three weeks. And then I'll never forget, we were, we were just stretching to start practice. And then our coach walked in and he said, uh, the league is canceled. You know, they, they're going to cancel the league. So, so yeah, I was there about a total of six weeks, played one game, 
Um, but that was the beginning of the pandemic. And that was just the end of my experience there. So with the pandemic that actually started, it, it's interesting because if I recall correctly, Korea was one of the places that was, you know, like you said, the contact tracing, they were reviewing the cameras, things like that. Uh, and then you're kind of contrasting it with, you know, there wasn't really any sense of urgency or anything. I think some people may have been kind of generally aware of it, but at that point in time, I don't think we had Rudy Gobert, you know, touching the microphones or anything, but the period of time that you go back to Korea, um, if you could kind of take us through that a little bit, because you had not been in the country for very long, presumably hadn't really known your teammates that well. What was like the lockdown period where you're not playing? It sounds like you're practicing. Uh, I mean, what was that period of time like? Were you allowed to kind of like leave your 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 housing? What, what was that like at that period of time for you before you actually did wind up coming back the second time to America? Yeah, it like looking back on it, it was it was really impressive how South Korea, you know, the government, their their healthcare system, how they handled the beginning stages of the pandemic. Like it, it, it's just so crazy. Like at that time, there was, and I just remember the numbers. I used to check every day. There was roughly ninety cases a day, a hundred cases a day. Not very much in the scope of things. And they were very, very cautious. Like there was already hand sanitizer everywhere. People were with masks. Uh, some places were closed down. Some places were only open certain hours. Uh, they, their technology was so advanced. They had the cameras that could sense the, you know, the body temperature already. Like they just were so advanced already. And um, me sitting over there, I felt very, very safe, extremely safe over there. We already had the testing, the, the rapid testing, the very accurate rapid testing at that point. So we just were very uh, advanced versus the story as I was getting back home was like, it's impossible to get a COVID test. And the, and the test I am taking, it's taking five, six days to get the results back. And it's hysteria. And there's everyone's running around trying to get toilet paper. And, you know, it just was... It, it just was crazy and you and people say oh the the you know covid started in asia somewhere well i felt super safe in asia but across the country you know across the world in in the states i feel like i wouldn't have been as comfortable so it was it was just it was just weird um i almost didn't want to go home i actually stayed an extra week than i needed to in South Korea, because like I feel safe here, and back home I'm hearing people are you know unfortunately getting sick and dying and things are crazy. So it was uh, it, again just really impressive to see how South Korea kind of handled that whole thing. And uh, you know I came home and people were like, "Do you have COVID? Like, are you sick?" I'm like looking at them like, "Do you have COVID?" <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm t there's like 80, 90 cases a day where I'm coming from, and there's 80, 90 cases an hour probably in New York. You know, yeah, basically it's crazy over and here. At that time, too, there were, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of deaths, too. I mean, not just cases, but deaths. Right. So it, it was really almost, it wasn't funny, but I'm always like, I'm almost laughing at people like, the place I'm coming from, I know it's Asia, but it was very safe, you know. So that's all I can really say. Yeah, it's definitely a contrast. And you can even talk about that in certain countries in Asia and, you know, all that. Uh, but it, it's certainly interesting, too, to see how different countries have evolved over time in terms of their treatment of it as well. And, you know, some of them are, as we're kind of, I guess, sort of reopening or learning to deal with the pandemic is probably the better phrase. But uh, certainly something that we could probably spend hours on here. But do you want to get back to Mexico because that's a, another season that you go back to the same club that you, you know, again, you highlight the fact that you're getting paid on time. Great situation. Great situation that you go back to gets even better because it results in a championship. If you would take us through now, it's the second season that you've been in Mexico, kind of what that season was like, as it like ultimately led to the greatest team success, something that you've talked about several times on this podcast already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, after my first year in Mexico, I just got hooked on team success. It, it just, you know, individual stats and accolades I found after games, I was the only one that was happy when that happened. But team success, winning games, winning championships, 
everybody's happy. The coach is happy. The fans are happy. The management's happy. My agent's happy. Probably makes his job easier. Everyone's happy. So I figured that out as my career went. Like, the more people I can make happy, my pay will kind of see the benefits from that. But if I'm only the only one over here happy with individual stats, it's it's not going to make the the decision makers happy to where they would, you know, want to compensate me for it. So I figured that out. And I think all young players need to figure that out too. So I went back for my second year. And again, the goal was the same to try to win a championship. So this is in a COVID shortened season. Um, the, the Mexican league just did a great job trying to put something together so quick because COVID had just kind of broke out and they still wanted to have a league. So some of the teams folded that were in the league the previous year. Um, we were able to put some together of roughly 10 teams. Um, we were staying in hotels. We were not staying in the nice apartments that we were the year before. Budgets dropped, you know, because a lot of the businesses were hurt by COVID naturally. So it was just something that uh, we were able to do and just say that we were still playing. So I was able to go back to my same team, and, and that was great. Went there. I was MVP finalist that season, and we finished, I believe, in first place in the regular season or second place in the regular season. And uh, we won that championship that year, which was great. Uh, it was only a three months season, finished in November. And then again, it's November, so I'm still looking to play, but jobs all around Europe and Asia were hard to come by, very hard to come by because one, some teams over here, folded Two, if they didn't fold budgets drop so what does that mean that means like when they're ready to cut a player they're going to give him more of a benefit of the doubt because they don't want to have to pay that guy out so teams weren't swapping guys like they do now they were being much more cautious with their money and there weren't many changes being made at that time so that was hard for me to find another job after i finished in november so so that was one stressful side of it. The other stressful side of it was going back home to New York, again, the epicenter of the pandemic, and trying to find a gym to work out in, trying to find a trainer who could who would work me out, trying to stay away from COVID. Just all of that was going on in the middle of the winter. Like that was hard for me to stay in shape as I'm looking for the new for for another gig. So it was very, very stressful. I was home for about eight weeks and I'm telling you, just nothing was really coming my way. And then finally, mid-January rolls around and the team in Greece, my, my one of my favorite countries, but again, just maybe not a league that fits my style, but a team in Greece um, called me and they were looking for a big. And I looked, the team was in second place at the time. Again, goes back to that winning, that winning mentality that I that I kind of discovered. Uh, I was like, man, I'm going, I'm going because if I don't take this in mid January, I don't know when another deal is going to come and the seasons are going to end in in May or so. So I went to Lavrio in in Greece, and uh, just a historic season for that club. This is a small, small club right outside Athens. Uh, typically this is a team who's fighting to stay in the league, but this particular year, this is a team that capitalized on COVID. They were able to sign some rookies that they normally would not be able to get, but you have to remember there was no NBA workouts the year before. There was no NBA summer league the year before. So some of the rookies that they got would probably be like borderline draft picks or like really good summer league players the year before, but there was none of that the year before because of COVID. So they were able to capitalize on that and sign a few really good rookies who were over on that team, killing it in, in the Greek league. And with that being said, they were in second place. So I kind of joined a bunch of rookies. It was, it was really weird for me, but it was a lot of fun with these young guys. Um, I was kind of, the, I was like 29 at the time, but I was an old guy on the team. And uh, we ended up making it to the finals in a COVID season and uh, we played Panathinaikos in the finals and we, we lost, I believe three, one, but again, historic season for that club and um, a lot of fun. Didn't have the individual numbers or whatever, but made it to the finals of the Greek league. 
one of my favorite moments of my career for sure. We have merch. Head over to the Expat Hoop Store where you'll find t-shirts, hoodies, masks, coffee mugs, pint glasses, and more. It's one of many ways you can show support for the podcast, so head over there and pick up some merch. That link below is in the video description, or you can head over to our website, expathoops.com, and click merch. We offer a couple of different Expat Hoops logos, and we have men's, women's, and kids' sizes, so you can get something for everyone. And so after a couple of winning seasons in the midst of COVID, um, you end up back in France. Um with uh with the club uh, chalet what was your next time in france like after the the success that you've had the past couple of seasons um you're getting through COVID. i assume it was much easier at this point than it had been in previous seasons to find a job um and this is probably also your first full season uh post COVID as well well after i finished in greece i actually went back another time to mexico so that this was my third time going back to Mexico. So, oh, wow. yeah. So I went back um, again, just the situations that I had after Greece, even though we had made it to the finals, just for me that summer in Europe, I didn't have uh, maybe some offers that I liked mm -hmm. or was able you know, that I wanted to take, but I still had Mexico there. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go back again to a team that I like, a club that I like, a city that I like and that has big time expectations, I'll just go back there. So I went back there. We won the championship again that year. So that's back-to-back -back championships in Mexico. And this was a full season, correct? Yep, this is okay. a full season. So this finished in December. No, no, this finished November. So I got there August. This finished in uh, November, right around Thanksgiving. Right around Thanksgiving. So I went back there to Mexico, won the championship back to back. And um, but this is just different than the year before the COVID time. I already had offers coming in like teams were were making moves this time and what they weren't so tight with their money um, like they were during the COVID time. So that was good. That was good. So I went home for about three weeks, just kind of sitting, trying to pick which one I wanted to take. And um, I was actually going to go to the BAL the Basketball Africa League. I think that that might have been that first year. Uh, I think I was going to go there to a team in Angola. But that fell through last minute. That fell through last minute. One of their sponsors, uh, something happened. They, they dropped out. They wouldn't be able to pay me the money that we had been talking about. So that fell through last minute. And then Cholet came about. And uh, they had been struggling. This is, again, a very historic uh, team, had been a EuroLeague team, had won championships in the past, very historic. And they're known for their youth program. Um, they have big-time uh, young players that get drafted or that um, they sign to long-term deals and they loan them out or sell them out. And that's how, kind of how they keep the operation running. So they're, they're big on that. Some of the guys that they had is like, Rudy Gobert. I was about to say, there comes our our second Rudy Gobert mention already. Yeah. So Rudy uh, developed there, Kevin Serafin, uh, Nando DiColo, Killian Hayes was with the Pistons, I believe. So like, that's kind of their deal. They they develop young players and then they, you know, push them onto the NBA or EuroLeague and, and that's kind of their thing. So this particular year, they had a few young guys that they were trying to play in the top league, French league, but they were struggling. The young kids, you know, they were, they were losing. So, uh, you know, they they figured, all right, they got to bring in some experience, some people who know the French League um, to try to turn things around. So at the same time, they brought in myself and a, and a point guard. And um, I'm not I'm not saying it was us, but we were able to just come in there and kind of just help the team and turn some things around. And we really got rolling. We really got rolling in Cholet. Uh, team was in last place in December. We ended up making it to the playoffs, which is really unheard of, maybe unprecedented. So we made the playoffs as an eight seed, and we played Asville in the quarterfinals, the EuroLeague team. Beat them game one on the road. Ended up losing game two at home, and then really had them on the ropes game three and on the road. Ended up losing by a couple points, but really just a tremendous season, especially from where we started. 
So you turn things around there. The following year, we come to where you are currently, which is Turkey. Um, this is a season that you uh, have had so far, and I believe you're you're still in the midst of it, correct? Yep, yep. Okay. Uh, how, how much longer is that season running? We have seven more games. Seven about more games. Six and, more weeks. And so tell us about the team you're with uh, and how you're doing on the court, first and foremost. Yeah, for sure. So finishing Cholet, and again, just goes back to that constant theme of team success kind of trumps individual success. So I went there. If you kind of maybe look at the record of when I got there, we won a lot of games. And then we went to the playoffs and pushed the yearly team to the, you know, to the backs against the wall. So that was very helpful for my market this summer, you know, combined with solid numbers last year in Cholet. I think I averaged like 10 and 7. Um, so I was able to get this deal in top league Turkey you know, which is a place I always wanted to play, had a couple of opportunities throughout my career, but just um, had heard negative things about certain clubs, maybe not getting paid or money being laid or whatever. So I just never pursued those opportunities, but I always wanted to play in the Turkish league, always heard great things about it. And I always felt like I'd be a pretty solid fit here. So this club came about Manisa. Uh, they had just come up from the second division last year, um, had great success last year. Um, wanted to keep that momentum rolling. So they um, moved on up to the first division. And again, expectations were kind of low to start the year. Um, but And we struggled to start. Um, I think we all were adjusting. Some of us that we signed were just new to the Turkish league, like myself. I think the club itself struggled just trying to understand how it works in the first league. I think the club was just figuring it out as well. Um, so we made some changes roster wise, we got in a new coach as well, and then we'd be able to turn it around. So right now we're right in the middle of the pack, right in a playoff hunt, uh, which is good with seven games to go. And then individually, you know, I, I, I couldn't, I, I couldn't be more fortunate, you know, just, you know, just here to kind of, I've been on an upward trajectory individually, but to come here and kind of really resurrect myself and and, and kind of put the chatter away that I'm that I'm finished that I'm not the player that I used to be to come here and I'm the only player in the league averaging a double double you know it, it just kind of just speaks to staying the course and, and and chasing good situations as opposed to money or other things that don't matter it's just important to kind of chase good situations trust your gut put in the work treat people the right way and um and, and i just couldn't be more thankful uh, if i may ask a question about the quality of play in turkey i know we've heard from some past guests who have played there that the league is much more i don't know it, it's for lack of a better explanation it's toughness oriented you know it's very very much a a rough league um to play in that's a reputation that it's had from some of the guests that we've had here can you speak to that yeah yeah definitely a tough league i would say tough league from the standpoint of um, each team is allotted five foreigners and a lot of the teams, let's say on the lower side, don't sign deep benches. They'll sign a couple Turkish guys and then the rest will kind of just be like maybe kids or young players. So, so the depth isn't there. Like I spoke on in Spain where in Spain, you're going to have like 10, 11 real pros on each team. Some of the teams in Turkey, especially the bottom half, it's really going to be your five foreigners and maybe two or three pro Turkish guys. So tough to speak to your point from the standpoint, especially as a foreigner. I know I got a lot. I got to log big minutes every night, not like in the French league, not like in the Spanish league. Last year in Cholet, I was able to play 20, 25, 26 minutes a night. Spain, same thing, 22, 23, 24 minutes, not in the Turkish league. I got to play 30, 32, 35, 36 minutes every night. That's just what it is. I'm not complaining. It just is what it is. So that's just toughness from that side. Then toughness from a physicality standpoint, very physical, very physical league. Um, I would say it's it's tough because the league, the foreigners are very talented here. I think uh, coaches and GMs um, pursue 
guys who can score the basketball, who can play one-on-one, -on -one, who can isolate. Like, that's just the type of foreigners you get here. Um, so that's tough. You got to be able to really hold your own defensively. It's 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 not as team oriented oriented defensively. You got to really be able to play one on one defense a lot here. So very different. Again, that's why I had to adjust my first six seven games here. It was a struggle for me. I was here trying to figure it out on the fly. We were losing, and when you, when you're losing, you don't really have much time to figure it out. You know they're looking to make changes. So I was fortunate again, kind of like my Varese year, able to get through that transitional phase and then kind of hit my stride and then with that the team hit its stride so it's all just kind of working in unison and, and 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 we're on a good track so i do have to talk about some off the court stuff you are in turkey in the midst of the tragic earthquake that happened a couple of months ago i know that you were not personally affected by it uh, as you're about several hundred miles west from where the actual epicenter of the earthquake and the affected area was However, you did say you knew people that were affected by it. Uh, can you tell us about your time there during the earthquake period, uh, how the teams react to it and what the culture was like? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, very tough situation uh, for the country. And again, for some of the people that I that I know here, um, one of my teammates, he has an uncle out there who lost his house. Uh, our general manager, he said he has a lot of friends out there who lost their lives, lost their, you know, valuables, their homes as well. There's a, a guy in our league. He lost his grandmother and his cousin. And, and you know, it's it just a lot of, you know, maybe people I don't know personally, but, you know, connections that I made or people that I've met that are just really hit by the tragedy. You know, at that time, we had one more game before we went into our fever break. Uh, so they ended up postponing that one game. Um, then I went home. I went back to the States. And then when we came back, we resumed practice. Um, so that was kind of that was kind of my experience. Again, like you touched on, I was I'm nowhere near that. I'm over on the uh, on the west side near Izmir. So I, I didn't I didn't feel it, but at the same time I feel it from the standpoint of the people around me are, are so affected. So it's been tough to deal with, but at the same time, I'm happy that the league decided to continue because I think it's something that people can kind of rally around. We're able to raise money. We've donated a lot of money as a league, as a team, um, to earthquake recovery. So I think us playing has been good uh, for the country and for the people and those affected, in my opinion. It seems trite to say, but uh, in speaking about your COVID period and now this earthquake period, and we've had several different instances of the podcast where people uh, have been playing in Ukraine and 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 move along from there, uh, it's always worth saying, and it seems somewhat trite to say, but it is worth saying that that sports can can be a welcome distraction from things that are going on in the world that are otherwise uh, difficult to deal with, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. You know, we're we're basketball players, we're professionals, um, but we're humans too. So we have feelings, we get it. You know, we're away from our families. There's things that happen. So when we're in a foreign country and maybe the people who pass away are not our family, we still feel a sense of togetherness, closeness with them. They're our teammates, they're our teammates' family members. And again, you know, it could, maybe a tragedy could happen like that in the States and they would feel the same way. They'd want to be close to us. So we just try to do our best and um, help in any way that we can. And uh, I, I hope that us playing can, can, can bring some, some level of solace and, and happiness to the people here in Turkey. Odian Osiki, it's been a pleasure talking with you on expat hoops. Good luck in the remainder of your season in Turkey, but as longtime listeners know, we're not done yet. We have some expat experts we wanted to ask you about. Uh, just a reminder to those listeners, uh, if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform, please head over to YouTube for those. OD, thanks for coming on the show today. I appreciate you guys. Thank you for having me. Hello, and thanks for watching. Be sure to give the video a like, and you can watch more videos over here. Uh, you can also click subscribe over here so you're notified when we have new content here on Expat Hoops.